Um, oh, it's on the bottom. Yeah. Cool. So our next speaker is Anna. Um, and you don't obviously, need to pronounce it. Yep. Everyone knows. Me. I won't pronounce it. <laughs> uh, hello, everyone. Can you hear me well? Yep. No. Hello. Yep. Good. Uh, my name is Anna Lezhikova. Okay, so I know there's a couple of Russians they can pronounce it. Uh, I'm Russian. Moved here five years ago with my family to New Zealand. Started developing Sloanin like two years ago, but been working for more than a year already as a full-stack uh, JavaScript developer at Cloudscape and uh, also studied machine learning and artificial intelligence in uh, Victoria University and a student member of data science research group at Callahan Research. Uh, and today I've got my Easter bunny. It's not Easter yet. He will be delivering some Easter bunnies, chocolate, chocolate bunnies, to people who will answer my non-tech questions today. And first one, uh, what, I love this movie, this prop is from the movie, what movie is this? And yeah, Indiana Jones. Deliver. <laughs> cool. Why this topic? Because I'm, uh, I'm, I'm sure you've seen me on uh, JavaScript Slack, I'm Anna. And uh, I'm a permanent resident there. I created a uh, function room channel. Uh, I, my favorite, like my languages I do almost every day are JavaScript, Coffee, Elm, uh, Erlang, and Java. That's what I do almost every day. So, I'm yep. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's better. So, and when I see people and just almost like every day and like regularly we have holy wars what's better object-oriented approach programming and javascript or functional so s oh, doesn't work. one day someone posts look at this feature and library i found and another person just oh you what are you doing there? You maintained the object, it's terrible. <laughs> go, oh my, this, what did I do? <laughs> and next moment, there are a lot of people like, no, you don't know how to program your immutability. Just, it's, it's so expensive, it takes so time. I've got one southern test, it runs so slow when you use immutable or lambda. But when you can read it so better and you can't mutate an object and functional is cool at the best, no object oriented is what we've been doing for it, you know, you've been there all. Oh. I'm sure everyone participated in this kind of debates. Yeah. Uh, and then I thought, is there really this holy grail that we should fight for? What's the question, what's the history of the question, what's the problem? And then I decided to look into the history of JavaScript and find a very interesting post by the, one of the main creators of the JavaScript. And his name is... Yay! And you pronounce it right, cool. Brandon Ike. This post from 2008. Just some uh, uh, pieces from there. That he was asked why did he create this thing and how he created it. And the main uh, ideas I got from this post are that uh, they wanted to have two languages and this that uh, uh, to have a language that will would solve two big groups of users, like developers' users. People who was in like C++ and then just appear in Oak Java language and getting very popular. And you know that Sun had some business to do with um, Netscape to create the thing, like business relation. Uh, and uh, another part, just more amateurs than pro, I would say. People who wrote these scripts every day was, didn't um, graduate from universities, was from different world. Like, kind of underground, programming underground. And they wanted a language that would, would uh, fit both these audiences. Also, the Sun Corporation wanted to promote the Java language a little bit. So they asked that it should look like Java. And, uh, but Brandon Ike agreed to do this job because he loved Scheme at that, say, at that time and wanted to do something like Scheme in the browser. All this combined, we got 
uh, language that inherited some of the features of the scheme. Schema belongs to the Lisp language group. Like as expressions, if you was at the Lambda uh, presentation some time ago, that's as expressions, like listed ones. Parenthesis list, and that's this struck me. You, I never th see the similarity between Lisp and old style JavaScript with a lot of parentheses. Now I know where it comes from. And create and relate code dynamically, typed variables dynamic type, first class functions, lambda, that's all come from scheme. But also from Java, we have um, class based, we don't have classes in JavaScript, but it's looking like classes, class based thing and object oriented for sure. Concurrent, we don't have it in JavaScript yet, but there's some talks, web workers, maybe something, I don't know. Structured syntax and expressions versus statements, all good. So we got our beautiful language that can be at the same time imperative, object oriented, and functional. How it can be all the three and what are what in these paradigms? Let's just, he, uh, let's just see in details. Procedural, procedural or imperative. Very simple th stuff, like iteration, step by step, we'll tell what to do, when to do, how to do. Either we do just for, it's also when, it's also this do and also ifs, all this simple. That's what you can do in JavaScript, right? It's all written in JavaScript. What the different approach? Uh, functional, when you just don't explain uh, how to do, you don't explain steps, you just, okay, iterate through this array, apply some function, this is lambda function, right? And or if you want to do some stuff like this, you can use recursion. You also can use this. Do you have to choose this or this and do it always like this. No, you don't. It depends on what you're trying to achieve. You want to get very, very high speed, very good performance, and it's very sensitive, you're like performance sensitive, you will choose this, right? It's faster in JavaScript. If you want to have uh, maintainability, readability better, and the, this like, milli parts of like milliseconds not important for you, maybe this will solve your style better. What I'm trying to point here, you don't have to choose once and for all. You just need to choose wise what suits your problem today better. But it's, uh, the other thing that, um, not just different, but also uh, in common with the two things, is that we have data outside of the logic. We have functions, we have some data. We apply the functions to, to the data. Totally different approach, like opposite approach, is object-oriented. When we have kind of classes, we have objects in JavaScript. And here it's a copy from MDN, how we define uh, and create classes. And you can see that we have lengths, uh, height and width, and get area and calculate area methods, all this inside the class object. So we combine business logic and uh, data logic uh, together. What the, the uh, this is like, uh, data and behavior in the same place, uh, blue prints and green prints, <laughs> okay, and instances, and all of the instances, because in JavaScript it's not instances, it's just different objects made uh, uh, after prototype object, and, but they all have this data and behavior, and when one day you just want to use you see that this behavior in blue and behavior in green in some objects might be the same, so your code is not dry, so you're writing a lot of the same pieces of code, you would like to reuse it. When you live in object-oriented uh, galaxy, what do you do when you want to reuse code? Inherit. You just get all these connections uh, from one object to another, and it's, uh, sometimes it can be really complicated help. What's the opposite approach? Remove data outside of the function. You've got an object, JSON object, or another object, some state object, and you've got a function. 
color function with these params taken from this object. That's all. Just get something in, then you get something out. If you look at this function, you'll see that calculating the area is just multiplying two variables. Can you use it somewhere else uh, that noth has nothing to do with calculating areas? Yes. For example, if you want to calculate the sum income for a year. The function is the same, how it would look in object-oriented world. Or my shapes uh, part of my app has nothing to do with income part of my app. Why should I combine my objects? But here we have the same function. We don't have to think about it. We just use different architecture. We get behavior, like some functions. We get some data. It doesn't have to be Redux store. It can be, but it doesn't have to. It can be anything. It can be API JSONs. You just feed the data, get composed functions that uh, produce, consume, produce, consume, get some result that can go back to the data or go outside or whatever. But the logic is your business and the logic and data just in different baskets. Do you have to choose one and for all which one? No. You can't use uh, all this functional approach when you've got a legacy code. When you're using libraries that are built totally like object-oriented. In our company, we use Mapbox a lot and try to do functional as much as we can. But we have to mix it all the time because we use uh, um, objects from Mapbox. And we have to combine and mix them with functions. So you just choose what suits best, your state of application. Uh, another thing I wanted to show about object-oriented that says a thing uh, I like about JavaScript. Oh, it doesn't work. Hold on. I can't open. I can open it. <laughs> Maybe here. Okay, let's try. This. Console panel. Yeah. Developers, developer, developer tools. I will make it big. Create an array. One, two, three. What this? Is it an array? It's an object with indexes, right? It, that it has all values we put there, but also it has uh, a reference to a prototype array. It has, again, it's an object. And uh, this is a function, I think so. And it also an object. And all these methods we have and keep there, that's where you put your object dot prototype dot and create new method. That's where it goes. And it's really, really like a mirror tunnel without end. And that's how arrays and are JavaS uh, in JavaScript look like. What the di what the well, what is the different approach? You see, huh? Oh. What's going on? No, I have it. I see Slack like messages. <laughs> what this? It's actually my first time seeing this. This error message. Now just check my file. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry for this it's unexpected behavior. It's like programming every day, is that? Right? Yeah. And what the different cow errors can look different. This is JavaScript approach. This errors in JavaScript. These errors are in Erlang. You can't iterate as a usual iteration in Erlang because you have to. Uh, you, there's no like indexing. 
To get to the middle of the array, you have to go through all head tail, all head tail with recursion. That's just how it works. That's different. But in JavaScript, you have this. Uh, what is functional in JavaScript? Yeah. We have first class functions. Everyone knows about it. We have lambdas. Lambdas, it sounds strange, but if you swap it with anonymous function, everyone understands, but it's the same. And closures, without closures, it would not be possible to have uh, nice functional JavaScript. This is an example. Uh, you've got a function, another function, some object with uh, an array, for example. Then you create a high order function that returns a function, and here R means Ramda. I'm using Ramda library here. Piping or composing or chaining, it's almost all the same in Ramda. It's called pipe, and it's very easy to understand. Can you understand it even if you don't uh, know Ramda library, right? If you add readable names, it's very easy to understand what this array is doing, like this function is doing, right? You just add one to every uh, element in the array and then make it, um, filter it and return only even uh, once, right? Easy. It's easy to read, easy to maintain, easy to reuse. That's functional JavaScript. What else we can have in JavaScript, but what, what we don't have in JavaScript, that people who do functional all the time say, oh, no, you can't do functional JavaScript. JavaScript just cannot be functional. It's tail recursion. There's some uh, attempts to do this. There's something that you can see and try, but it's still work of the future. And I hope we will have it maybe. Maybe not this year, but maybe next year, and there will more browsers will support it. You can do, but it's not spread yet. Uh, so you have to use recursion in JavaScript very, very careful at the moment. We don't have uh, in language enforcement of purity. So you can make a function pure, you cannot. No one will, it, like, no one complain. I mean, like, machine, your machine won't complain. Uh, and that's what differs from functional languages. And another thing, the language doesn't enforce immutability. There are some libraries you can use, but you don't have to. So that's about this. Another thing that uh, functional people say about JavaScript and JavaScript developers, it's a concept. When I read about it, I feel like this. Can you guess what the concept is? Functional people say that you don't, un if you don't understand that you are not a developer. No? No? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll have it. Monads. Okay, how, how much time do I have? Uh, you got back to, uh, 15 minutes. 15 minutes, okay, I can explain monads to you. Like <laughs> <laughs> really? I got it, really. Monads. Just imagine that you have some language. In this language, you have three functions. One, two, six. Who can guess why the third function is called six, not four? Four is two. two. Hmm? You can compose any number between. It's, it's non tech question. Who can guess why that six, not four, or five, or three? Yay! I just wanted some number that will fit nicely. Three, three, three. <laughs> Good job. And imagine, so these functions, you want to change them, and you don't have to have types to do monads, but just imagine that these are types. You consume this, produce this, next function, do the same. And just imagine a language that has strong types. And you can't chain functions that uh, produce can uh, consume different types. Just not possible. Then imagine that some function sometimes return b, sometimes x. Like for example, uh, sometimes it returns your value, sometimes undefined, sometimes null. Null, undefined, and your value, for example, integer, are all different types. And your language doesn't support returning different types. Can't be. 
You know what language I'm talking about, right? Yeah? Okay, I've got this. What language I'm talking about? Haskell, yay. <laughs> Another thing what you can't have in Haskell and other strong functional languages, side effects. It's just not possible to return something and to do something else. You just are not allowed to do this. But all you know that you can't do web development without these things, just not possible. All I.O. is returning sometimes unexpected things. All reactive programming is about having side effects. All HTTP requests, it's all about side effects. And how many times have you used console log today or yesterday? Yeah, so we all do this all the time. It's all side effects. What do you do to have this when you, uh, when you have like limited not to have it? You create a space where you can do this. So in Haskell, they create monads. It's some space that you can do all these nasty things. And they just called it with the name you can't understand, so you don't know that they do things they tell they hate, right? <laughs> but you don't have to know Haskell to know about monads, because if you use JavaScript, uh, you use monads. This is jQuery, right? And uh, jQuery is uh, using monoid objects. Uh, this is a simple function. When we do select, we create an object, because monad is type of monoid object. It has type, all, all the same. Monad in Haskell and anywhere, anywhere had the same type. It's monoid type. It creates an object that has very like, much like Java classes or any object we use in JavaScript. It has value, it has getters, setters, and bind. I will just explain what it means. Here, you create a monoid object. Well, let's call it Ajax monad. Ajax monad object. And the value of this object is this DOM element, select. You can You've got built-in functions like get to set. You can get the value, you can set the value, you can change the value. And you have a bind, some place like key value pair, where the value is a function that you bind this value. So you can take this function, take the value as a parameter, and call it. Here we have bind HTML. As you can see, HTML is the next function in the row, right? When we do this, we call this monad object, and it creates, it returns another monad object, Ajax monad, of the same type, but now with just different value, with the same uh, util uh, functions, and bind, it just bind, bind to next function. And you see that this all, it's not returning anything. It's creating side effects. It returning itself with some information changed inside and do stuff while be called. Next one, if we just return this one, call it, it will change the value with select menu, blah, blah, blah. The, your DOM object will change and your bind function will be the next one. At the end, you're not returning, like you're not returning this object again but you finished with doing all of these side effects. Yep, what you kept doing, you chained your functions, they returned the same uh, type every time, monoid object, you got some side effects, you, got, you kept the value there, you passed it, you kept the functions, you passed it, and also you can, uh, for example, if it was broken somewhere here, it will just didn't call this and will stop there. That's, does it remind you something you use in JavaScript also? Promises. Promises when you have call something, get back, get this result, apply a function, and have catch at the end. So if something get, uh, went wrong, you just catch it. Promises, it's also use monad uh, logic. So it's not so difficult, really. 
And if you don't just, in JavaScript, we don't have to create monads, we just use them. In Haskell, if they want to do something, they have to use libraries or to create their own monads, that's all. But if you don't know how to create a monad, it doesn't mean that you don't understand a monad and confuse it. So because you, we all use jQuery or promises or something like this. Did I, like, was I successful in making more easy and simpler monads? Yes, no? Oh. Why the, but why the problem is about this? Why are you laughing about monads? Why I'm talking about, why I'm like saying out that you understood it better? Because monad is used to segregate or to uh, functional programming world for, for many, many years was very uh, um, elitarian. They, were, they didn't want to include everyone. It was excluding society. They're trying to be more open mouth but still there are a lot of people who like, uh, feel uh, superior to others who don't do functional. They use Monad as a tool to keep this secular um, society, really. It's not so difficult. It's, it's really simple, but it's so easy to say, ah, oh, you don't understand what Monad is, okay. Just don't, don't uh, catch this bait, okay, anymore. Now you can explain it. I understand, I use Monad every day, I use jQuery. <laughs> so, JavaScript, it can be imperative, object-oriented, functional, and you can see it's you who choose what it to be. Why, and when it's it combined, it's a really powerful tool. And when it's separate, it's not so. And why it's also powerful, because it can, combine, uh, it can get together people of different paradigms, of different thinking. That's, you, you, some of you uh, know me like a um, diversity evang evangelista. <laughs> <laughs> and this is why I love JavaScript, it's the most diverse language. It can get people together of different mindsets, of different thinking, different background, and you can make it whatever you want, and you can buy different teams and approaches, architectures, whatever. It's really, really powerful. But you know, with, with uh, great power comes great responsibility. So it's not language that bad. Sometimes we just don't know how to use it, but it's not language to blame. So I hope that I showed you what the real grail is, and I hope that there will be no more holy wars that just waste our time and that we can combine, get together and create beautiful applications with the beautiful architectures and different approaches using the most of JavaScript we can. Thank you. <laughs> ah, is there time for questions? No? Yeah. No, no, if there's time I can, if you can ask, but, ah, okay, if you have any questions. <laughs> but not about monads, please. <laughs> no. Any questions? Yes, Samson. Testing, testing. Yes, it's yours. Ah, okay. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning that you uh, were doing setting a bit of AI and stuff like that. Have you been uh, able to do that with uh, in JavaScript at the moment? Or are you playing with that? Actually, there are quite a few libraries uh, and GitHub repositories that they uh, offer you engines for machine like models for machine learning. If you look up, I think. Oh no, we don't have history in JavaScript channel. Because I already asked, and there are so many um, links to GitHub repositories that they just, they're models in JavaScript, like machine learning models. You just feed the data, like Amazon machine learning, for example, or um, Google's TensorFlow, something like this. It's not very complicated, but it's possible to use it in simple online apps in your production code already. Yes, you can, because machine learning, it's not about language, it's about algorithms, and the object-oriented part of the JavaScript can really be shine at this, because uh, machine learning 
it's part of it functions, but another difficult part is about data structures and algorithms. And you see this indexed arrays and objects easier to use uh, a bunch of search algorithms than recursion ones. Yeah. Any more questions? Still got a few more minutes. Uh, Bunny, yeah. Yeah, I've got one more. It can be anything, not about JavaScript or they talk, anything, because, yeah. Yes, please. Turn it on. Hey. So a lot of companies have got like coding style guides and they might relate to like using object oriented versus functional. Um, are you advocating for a, like, a polishment to those style guides or like a more sort of free style guide for the company? Uh, I would separate this because functional sometimes about style, like, okay, let's pipe everything. But sometimes it's really about logic. And for me, JavaScript divided into like, in, is it when I see some like, uh, when I see code base and someone will ask me, is it functional or is it object oriented? What I will look at first is the division of data and business logic. If it's divided, if it's using, for example, Redux and some functions and this stuff, yes, yeah, functional. If it's only classes and all the logic is inside the classes, then it's object oriented more. Style is um, uh, like it can deceive you. It might look like functional, but not be functional in, log like in logic and thinking. So functional and object created, it's more about um, designing and combining things than um, reading or writing them. So yeah, thank you. Very much. Thanks, everyone. So we're going to take a break now. Um.